we are in Genesis 40, and doesn't that picture just make you sad? I mean, that's not the reason for it. But the truth of it is, is that we, all of us, have felt forgotten at one point in our life. It has happened as children or even as adults. We've been felt forgotten at work or our mom forgot to pick us up at school. That happened to me, by the way. We all go through times where we feel unloved, and we're wondering where God is at in our lives. And everyone is going to go through different experiences, so we got to be really, really careful to compare with someone else, right? Because that, that's our sinful tendency to make comparisons. But what you have gone through and feeling abandoned or forgotten, someone else may never understand. But God does understand that. And so we, we have to be careful that when we share our testimonies, well, it, it's not what happened to them, so I guess it's, it's not as important or it's not as bad as what happened to this other person. When you feel unloved, no matter who you are, no matter what has happened to you, when you feel forgotten and unloved, it is a trauma to you, isn't it? Why, why do you think I always end letters whether they're the chats that we send out through the week or the pastoral letters with you are loved, and why is it above our door? Because people make really bad decisions when they feel unloved. When people feel forgotten and abandoned, there is a strong tendency to make very poor decisions, not healthy, wise decisions. And each of us need to understand that at one point or another, and we could, you could be right now sitting in the chair, and you literally feel abandoned and forgotten. But the point of this message, and I want to be very clear on what this message is all about, is that in Christ, you are never forgotten, you are never unloved. And why is this? And it's two simple reasons that, kids, you need to be listening to and, and be able to repeat this to your parents tonight or throughout the week. The only two reasons that you need, God's character and God's promises. God's character and God's promises are the reason that you are never forgotten, you are never, ever abandoned. This is what we learn from the story of Joseph. Because what he is experiencing is the recipe for desperation, depression, and complete and utter hopelessness. We begin reading in Genesis 40. Verse 1, then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with the two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. Just so you know, these are political positions. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail. And please underline this in the Bible, in your Bibles, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them. And they were in confinement for some time. So now Joseph is actually two of the highest court officials. He is over them in authority. Interesting, isn't it? Then the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night. Each man with his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's official who were with them in confinement in his master's house, why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. As it was budding, its blossoms came out, came out and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now jo Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes, Squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hands. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep in mind, me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should have put me into this dungeon. When the chief baker saw that he had interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. 
And in the top basket, there was some sort of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. And the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. Then Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh off of you. Not very good news, is it? Thus it came about on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. At this moment, after those basically two years of Joseph being forgotten, do you think he felt or struggled to feel loved by God? As anyone would, but is it not interesting that he would have most likely remembered the dreams he had when he was 17 years of age, and if God fulfilled his interpretation of these two dreams of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, did it not probably console greatly Joseph's heart that such my dreams will one day be fulfilled. I will one day be out of this dungeon. God's promises back in these days were through the dreams. They did not have the word of God as we do today. So his dreams would have been that assurance that God is going to fulfill his plan for my life. God will one day save and rescue me. I want to mention something before I get lost in a lot of other points that I do believe that you are to take notice of your dreams. But it's not the dreams of I've always dreamt to have a house on the beach in Hawaii. I'm not talking about those kind of dreams. Sorry, I'm sorry. Jolene, we will have to talk afterwards. But there is a change And there is something very important that is not talked about near enough with those secret desires of our hearts. Those are the real dreams put there by the Holy Spirit. And those are joys that you need to have fulfilled. And those are too much belittled and discredited by the church of Jesus because really they don't know what they're talking about. God has intricately woven how he's made you to be part and parcel with the desires of your heart that are secret, and they're secret because why? Because God is the one that put them there. And God is the only one that can fulfill them. As you are crucified more and more in Christ, you decrease so that Christ increases. As such, God will reveal those secret desires of your heart. But if it's your dreams, your selfish ambitions, those will never, ever happen. How do you know if your dreams are secret joys, secret desires in your heart? Easy. Do they build God's kingdom and glorify God? Now, I'm not saying you couldn't do that in the beach house in Hawaii, but that's personal desires or could be selfish versus really for God's kingdom, which is the story of Joseph. So those secret desires in our heart are really those dreams that God knows that they need to be fulfilled in your life for his glory and the fulfillment, listen to this, the fulfillment of your joy. So don't discredit those things that are deep within your heart like, oh, they don't matter, they're they're not important, I should just completely ignore them. No, 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 no. They're there for a reason. And God is a sovereign God, and he can orchestrate everything to make those joys become a reality, those secret desires. I can give you so many examples, and really we don't have the time Uh, Because we have to go over so many points that are super important. But simply this, uh, and I can mention secret desires in my heart that God has fulfilled. But I'll mention one of Tanya, her secret desire to one day teach and preach the gospel. Well, preach in terms of what a woman can write and what is allowed to in that missionary context. To spread the gospel in a jail in Africa to parents and kids. And lo and behold, at the end of her time in Africa... God completely fulfilled that secret desire. And she taught the gospel to parents and children, because in Africa, a lot of times, the children are in jail with their parents in a separate courtyard. But the dream, quote unquote, the dream was fulfilled. Now, is God that good, or he doesn't really do those kind of things? 
like that was just by accident? Or do you believe God is that good that he knows what is truly going to make you have that divine joy in your life and to glorify him? Is God that good? Because if you don't believe God is that good, you're going to try to fulfill your own desires in a sinful way instead of trusting God to do it in his way, and it's not going to end up very pretty, is it? It's going to end up pretty bad. And so God's character matters. Is God good to Joseph when you understand that he is now going to be in jail the entire time, a total of 12 years? He's been forgotten by the time he gets out and the time that the chief cupbearer and the chief baker were in there. There was two extra years from the already 10 years he had been in the dungeon. Is it hard to be patient? Now, most of you have not lived in a dungeon for 12 years like Joseph. But yet, most of you have never and will never experience what he experienced being the most powerful man in the world. So God is a God of perfect compensation, isn't he? Whatever you've suffered, and it could be some pretty extreme things, God will compensate you in his perfect sovereignty, will he not? Look at Job, the man most suffered in all the world. Wow. Really? I mean, that's wow. And look at his compensation. That's even more wow. So we have to understand that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. We have to understand this. This is something, a principle I want each of you to write down. Do not ever trust in your circumstances to define God's view of you or his plan for your life. I'm going to say it again. Do not ever trust in your circumstances to define God's view of you or his plan for your life. Because for Joseph, God's forgotten me. That could have been the temptation for him. Because I'm stuck here in this dungeon for 12 years. Obviously, God doesn't love me as he does other people. Have you ever thought that before? I know that many of you have because I've heard it. God loves everyone else because look at their life, look at their marriage, look at their children, look at what they get to do or what they haven't suffered like me. God obviously loves them more than he loves me. For one, that is pure heresy, isn't it? God is perfect in his love. It is unconditional. It is not based on what you have or have not done. It is based on God's character. That is true salvation. It is only based on on the character and the promises of God. You and I only have salvation because God promises to save you from your sins if you trust alone in Jesus. And he promised you he will never leave you nor forsake you. Here's something interesting, though, about time. We all know that time is relative. As you get older, time seems to advance more rapidly, doesn't it? Kindergarten? It's like an eternity for that kindergarten. But for someone that is older, even their 50s, 60s, time seems to speed up. But for God, in 2 Peter 3, 8, it says that one day is but a thousand years, a thousand years to a day for the Lord. God is not controlled by time. The fact that Joseph is in prison for 12 years, that extensive amount of time would be, logically speaking, harder and harder to believe that God is good, right? It's gone on for so long. These marriage conflicts have happened for so long. My child has been rebellious for so long. Obviously, God has done with us. He has turned his back on us. There's really no more hope because look how long it's been. God is not affected by time. And here's the second point. God does not change. Remember Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In theology, it's called immutability. God never, ever changes. But you and I, do we change a lot? And we have a consistency to some degree in certain areas of our character, but we can change a lot depending on if we have a headache or not, if our day went well or not, if we haven't eaten enough, we can change real fast. That guy cuts us off when it's icy, and you're like, of all days to cut me off when there's sheer ice on the road, We can change really quick, and we lose our spirituality really fast, don't we? That never happens with God. 
Matthew 28, 20, when Jesus is ascending back to heaven, he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And not only that, we know from John, uh, John 16, John also 17, we know that he has left us the Holy Spirit of promise, the Holy Spirit of comfort. So not only did he promise that he will be with us to the end of the age, he also promised us the comfort and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we always, for those of us that are in Jesus Christ, we always, always are with Jesus, and Jesus is always with us. Whether or not we feel it or not makes no difference. It's a fact. It is doctrine, sound doctrine. God also promises to never abandon us. I remember when I was, I was pretty young still, I was around probably 16 or 17 when I first read this verse, and it blew me away. And it has impacted my life ever since then, and it's Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? And this, this blew me away the first time I read it. Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. The tender love of a true noble mo- mother who would die for her child, who would never ever put herself before her child that is feeding her child even if she forgets I will never forget you so the faithfulness of a true noble mother is nothing compared to the love and nurturing care of God our father and we need to dwell and meditate on that because every day Satan is bombarding us with the lies screaming at us that we are unloved, that God doesn't care, God is not good, God has forsaken this world, God doesn't know what he's doing, God is in control of everything else in the world and other people, but not your life. God can't see what's happening inside my home, and he doesn't really care what's happening inside my marriage. Yes, he does more than you do. And we need to understand the greatness of God to truly live a life pleasing to him by faith. And we're going to transition now, as we've talked about these principles now for the last few minutes, and to transition to the practical part of this message. The job of a church, of a pastor, according to Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, is to train and equip the flock, the, sh- the sheep of God. Yes or no? It's not just to download a bunch of Bible knowledge in your brains and to magically think that that's going to impact and transform your life. It will not. Academic knowledge of God's word will not change and transform a sinful, rebellious heart. It takes the work of the Holy Spirit to take the truth of God and apply it into my heart to bring that conviction. Amen? And when there is not weekly repentance, and you experience a conviction like, man, that was a really hard message, or man, God really convicted me, and and maybe even you don't tell that to anyone, but you don't do anything about it. You know God was speaking to you, but you didn't confess, you didn't repent, And repentance just means a change of mind that I'm not going to do things that way. I'm going to do them this way. It's that leaving pride and going to humility. When we hear messages week after week and there's no response to that in obedience, guess what happens to our heart? It actually hardens. The mind gets puffed up, Paul says. But that knowledge begins to wear away at our hearts that are not submissive to the Holy Spirit. And that is a great danger. But God is constantly working, and he never fails. That's what's amazing. No matter how stubborn or how many times I'm not hearing the voice of God, God always wins, doesn't he? He always, always accomplishes his purposes for my life. In what areas does he do that? Two areas. Are you ready for those that are writing, taking notes? He does it through our character, and he does it through competency, those two things. Remember in the building of the tabernacle, did God give those men special skills to do extremely intricate work with the metals, with the wood, with all of the decoration, all the instruments to use in the tabernacle? It says clearly that God gave them these skills, didn't he? So God is constantly working in our hearts and lives to break down those sinful areas in our character and through trials and tribulations that we've all gone through and will always go through until heaven, but he is also teaching us skills that we need to be successful. So God is teaching Joseph the skills of stewardship in very difficult circumstances, isn't he? 
has not and does not God do that in your own life as well? Like, I want to be in school and just sit there in that chair. Remember last week's message, God's school? I just want to sit in that chair, have my cup of coffee, everything around me to go really well so that I can be focused and concentrate on what it is I'm learning because that is really enjoyable, isn't it? Almost everyone I know likes to learn things, don't they? It's enjoyable to learn new things in a, in a very calm, peaceful environment. But what happens when that environment that God chooses to teach you is a war? And there's chaos all around you. That's not very enjoyable. I can't sit down with my cup of coffee and take notes and just enjoy the moment. Or sit in a park under a tree and just everything is calm and peaceful and just enjoy what God is teaching me. A lot of times, I would say most of the times, God's lessons come in very difficult circumstances. It's like what the women are studying in the, in the marriage book uh, by Gary Thomas, who's one of my professors on sacred marriage. God's purpose for marriage is to make you holy, not happy. Most of our culture doesn't get that. Sanctification happens because your spouse knows everything about you and has a lot of ammo. And so do you with him or her. And when those conflicts happen, that's, as Gary Thomas points out rightly, you either see that reflection in the mirror and thank God and ask for that change in your heart, or you break the mirror. And that would be basically divorce. God's training, God's school is not for the faint of heart. Sometimes it feels like God is not very merciful, doesn't it? And yet God's mercy is that he is breaking you and I from the worst enemy imaginable. And it's not your spouse. It's not your child. It's not your boss. It's not the man in, in sitting in the residency at the White House. That's not our worst enemy. Our worst enemy is our own sinful rebellion. It always is. It always has been. Do you truly want to have that peace and joy in your life, no matter what your spouse does, no matter what your children does, do or don't do, no matter what the politicians do or the world around you, what is going on around them, do you want to have that, that freedom in Christ that even if you're in a dungeon like Joseph, you know God's character is for sure, he will never change, and God's promises are for sure, and that when you make that your only hope and confidence, you will experience that freedom that only God can give you. And so God sends you through some really dark circumstances at times that do not make any logical sense. And the very fact that they make no logical sense, that all the logic that's going on in my brain leads me to hopelessness and despair, like Joseph, is exactly the reason why God's doing it. To teach you, you cannot trust in your own reasonings, in your own circumstances. You cannot let life and what has happened to you or what's happening to you now define who God is or what God says about you because that's our tendency. God, if this is happening to me, that means you don't love me and you don't have good plans for me. That means I am to wallow in my self-pity and I am to fall into depression and hopelessness. And sure enough, all of us will apart apart from this book, amen? King David, extremely successful, amen? But yet, look at the Psalms. Look at his desperation. Look at how he says, crying out to God, but you will never forsake me. You will never let my soul go down to Sheol. And the Psalms bring so much comfort to our hearts. Why? Because David had to go through so, so much himself. His most glorious spiritual times when he was running from King Saul. And isn't it interesting how even though King David was a forerunner to Christ, just like Joseph was, both men were ridiculed and persecuted by their brothers. And that's how King David started out, being ridiculed and made fun of by his older brothers. He was the youngest, just like Joseph was the youngest. That persecution, that criticism from other people, is to prune and is to purify us to break us, to have us be crucified with Christ so that Christ increases in our life and we decrease. Because even if criticism from other people 
is not true, it still hurts, doesn't it? It's still painful. Even if you know, I know, there could be like 5% that is true, but I know that 95% is not true at all. It still hurts and it still wounds. It still is a blow to our pride, and if we're not careful, can lead us to great discouragement. But even that unjust criticism is for the purpose of God to break down our character, isn't it? So there's this tension that goes through our life between character and competency that God is continually working on to teach us in both areas. So you could have a great degree and be super smart academically, competency, but not have the character, and you fail at your job or you fail at life. So which is more important, competency or character? Well, we could say definitely character is, right? That's the moral integrity, the moral fiber of our beings. But you also need the competency because you want that surgeon to be really competent, don't you? So that's important that the engineer really knows how to be an engineer. Then that bridge is going to sustain the weight that it is designed to sustain. You need that competency from pastors and spiritual leaders, amen? Because they are physicians of the souls. You have to be competent in the word of God But that character, that integrity has to be there to undergird everything. So that is what God has been doing in your life ever since you've been born, amen? He's been teaching you character and he's been teaching you skills that you need to do what? To make a lot of money? He has been teaching you character and competency all your life to use those skills and to use that faithfulness and that humility, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, To build his kingdom. So there's a logic that we have to go through. There's a rationale. If God has given you the secret desires of your heart, or they're they're there. They're there in your heart, even if you don't know what they are right now. They are directly connected to the building of his kingdom. So what does that mean? Theologically, doctrinally, you can never, ever be fully satisfied unless those secret desires of your heart are mixed in, integrated into the building of God's kingdom. They have to be interconnected. That's why it's impossible, hear me out, it's impossible to know and to have fulfilled the secret desires of your heart apart from the church of Jesus Christ. Because who designed this church? Jesus did. To have a low view of church is to have a low view of God. And nowadays, people think, well, I can just do church online. It doesn't really matter. It matters. Show me in the Bible that you can't use the internet as your norm. I don't mean every once in a while, that's fine. But as your go-to every Sunday, show me in the Bible where it disproves that that's wrong. Well, (laughs) there's hundreds of passages about the membership of the body of Christ. But here's the main key one that you all need to know. Did Jesus decide in the Garden of Gethsemane to say, you know what, tomorrow I don't really want to hang on a cross. I think I'd rather do it virtually online. Or did Jesus physically carry that cross down the road of Golgotha and hang there until 3 o'clock in the afternoon and he gave up his spirit? He physically died for you. He physically was buried. He physically rose again on the third day. Why do you think we have the offering plate up in front? So that you physically get off your chair and go as an act of worship and joy and give to the Lord that which is already his. And it's not 10%. People think that. God is the owner of 100%. Everything you have right now belongs to God. Your clothes, your car, your bank accounts, your home, everything belongs to God. He is the sustainer. He is the good giver. And what Joseph is learning is true stewardship through brokenness. Does seminary, seminaries in general truly train pastors, or does God train pastors? That's why they call it cemetery more than seminary, right? Because it really is true. Really, really is true. At the best of the best, I don't know if it still is, 
But when Tanya and I were in college, the best of the best in the world for Bible college was, was Moody Bible Institute. And it was hard. Sorry, Isaiah, but, and Isaiah is planning on heading there. But it's difficult. But the youth pastors that were there, the youth pastor majors on my dorm floor or other, other dorms, I would never send my kids to a youth group. They were the most immature guys in the, in the entire Bible college. I don't think most of them were even saved. But they knew how to have fun, right? But what did God use? There, there's character and competency involved in Bible college. And it's a, it's a Bachelor of Arts degree. Just like a normal university, you have to take math, science, all of that. Like a normal university, you have to take. I learned a lot. But God's schoolhouse was not in all those brick buildings in downtown Chicago. It was in a tiny room on my dorm floor that, listen, that God put. And that dorm room, that building was old. But God put that room in there, I believe, for four years just for me. In four years. It was so small that there was, there was actually a full-size desk in there. But you, you had to go in and, and, and go in in the side and, and shut the door behind you and sit down in the chair. That's how small the room was. And yet I had gone through so much trauma and tragedy in my life, and I was still reeling with, uh, I guess you call it post-traumatic stress disorders. I was still having panic attacks. I was still waking up in cold sweats. And I was still scared for my life. Things were still happening to me and my family. But those four years, the only reason why I survived and made it, and God did the work he wanted to accomplish in my life, was sitting at that desk, crying my eyes out before the Lord for his salvation. For years, I was in the same dorm room, the same dorm floor. No one used that room except me. Never once in all those four years did anyone ever go in or I had to go back to my room because someone was using it. For me, that was my dungeon that actually started when I was 17. But that was my room. It was so tiny. It was not comfortable to study or do anything in, which is obviously why no one used it, except it was perfect for prayer. That was God's school. So I was going through a torture, a, a, a trial, tribulations, those four years that was continuing on from my childhood that no one in the school ever knew about. God was teaching these skills for ministry, but he was mainly breaking my heart. Without that, and I've told you this, if your pastor or any spiritual leader doesn't experience Isaiah 6 of that breaking of seeing the holiness of God and saying, woe is me, a man who is undone, a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips, don't ever go to that church because he is a corrupt man. I don't care if he's PhD in Greek or Hebrew, he is corrupt. You cannot lead the people of God without a broken heart. And God is an expert at breaking us, isn't he? No one knows how to break you better than God. That was God's schoolhouse. And, I, and, and God freed me of so much, especially my last semester through the book of Colossians. And then... The schoolhouse of God continued, and I went back, and for that year, thinking I'd raise support, because I was already a full-time missionary with a mission board based out of, out of Dallas, Texas, before I even graduated from, from Moody. And I thought, well, I'm going to raise support, this, that, or other. But my brother's car accident the last semester, the, I was actually Christmas break, of course, changed all of that. God's schoolhouse continued for me, not doing all the ministry stuff I had thought I was going to do, not raise all my support to be able to quickly go to language school, it was, again, God breaking me down, teaching me servanthood, taking care of my older brother, handicapped, washing him, bathing him, cleaning up after him because he could not on his own, him getting mad at me, doing physical rehab because the pain was so intense, his brain, of course, not working from the head trauma, my brother never even saying bye. When he left to the military, I didn't even know he left. He's four years older than me. He never even said bye. He just left. But once again, 
here I am. He didn't take care of me, really, but now I'm taking care of him. How do you be a successful missionary if you don't learn servanthood? Right? How do you serve other people where you no longer think about yourself, you only think about the needs of others unless God breaks you? Because if he doesn't break you, you will always be the center point of your life instead of Christ. You will not have no space for other people. You will not care when you're at church or at school or in a store about what other people are suffering. Because you've never learned servanthood. As Christ said, I came not to be served but to serve and give my life as a ransom to all mankind. That's the standard is Christ's standard. That's why we don't want church to be some place where you just feel entertained and you feel good about yourself every Sunday, and that's why you come back. That's not the point of church. The point of church is that every Sunday you see more the beauty of Jesus Christ, and that's why you want to come back. Because Christ becomes more and more beautiful and precious to you. You're not thinking about what does it do for me. You're thinking about I've seen the glory of Christ, and I want more of Jesus. So in the story of Joseph, in his life, God's control over Joseph is in every circumstance. He's in the king's prison, and he's putting the king's officials inside the prison with Joseph. He is teaching Joseph the skill and use of discernment. That is his personal competency, and he is training Joseph through hardship for his personal character. Why do we know for certain that Joseph was broken in prison? Because when he saw his brothers the second time, he cried so loud all of Egypt heard him. A prideful man that knows all the answers, that has all the power, and that power has gone to his head, is never, ever going to cry so that all of Egypt hears him weeping. Because his brothers hated him. But he loved the fact that he got to see him. They got to see them. He got to see them. And that emotion took him over. And he weeped so loud. A hardened, prideful man would never have done that. He would have sent them all straight to prison. Probably wouldn't have killed them, but he would have sent them all to prison. If I had to go through prison for 12 years, living in a dungeon... You're going to be longer in prison. And he would have had revenge. He would have called his dad to come down. Dad, look what they did to me. I'm going to tell you everything. Here's what's interesting about the story of Joseph. You don't hear any of that. You don't hear Joseph tattletaling. Because I would have tattletaled. I would have said, Dad, you didn't know what my rotten, nasty brothers did to me. That's not what happened. Why? Because Joseph truly forgave and his heart was truly broken. I have no rights. So the Bill of Rights in our country, it's great for a country. It's not great for your spiritual life. Because we do not have rights. The right we do have is to be spending an eternity in hell and Jesus came to save us from that. And that is a joy that we need to treasure every single day of our lives. In the middle of the circumstance that you have gone through, and and you probably could all share with me some very dark times in your life, amen? Where you felt like God was just nowhere and that you were forgotten. But now looking back, you can see what God was doing in your life, right? But here is the struggle and the hardship of us with our sinful nature We have very short-term memory. And we forget God's faithfulness and all those heart-wrenching prayers that we were crying out to God to answer. God answered in a miraculous way, and then a few days later, we all of a sudden forget. We forget the goodness of God as we approach a different new trial, a new tribulation, and all of a sudden that entire memory is lost. 
That is why I want to encourage you to do something. We have these for you. And I'm thankful for Pastor Nick doing a uh, mock timeline. This is a fake timeline, by the way, but it gives you an idea of what a timeline should look like, a personal timeline. And there is an index up on top, and you can all take one of these as a copy. But each of these boxes are key events, key moments in your life that you can write down and know how God has worked in your life in the past, now, and how God will probably continue to work in your life in the future. It can give you great comfort and insurance, but it is not an easy assignment. The timeline index is the following. These are just examples. Key dates in your life, including the year or your age. Who are the divine contacts that God placed sovereignly in your life? What are the key events? What are the significant crises or losses in your life? What are the key transitions such as graduation, go- job change, or a move from a city or state, and even romantic relation- relationships and marriage events? I would encourage each of you, and it does not take long to do this, and I've done this many years ago, but I would encourage you not just to use one page, but I would encourage you to do it by hand and use two pages and tape them together. Make that timeline. If you're older, you're going to have to have probably three pages. That's okay. Don't feel bad but you have more opportunity to see the faithfulness of God in your life, amen? I do want to warn you, though, if you decide to do this timeline, which is not a difficult thing to do. But what I've seen is that it will bring up emotions and memories that you have forgotten. And it can bring you to a point of tears when you think about certain things that you happen that possibly you forgot about, but radically impacted your life and change the direction of your life. And it's important to look back and recognize the hand of God, that it was God there with you. It wasn't by accident that you met that man. It wasn't by accident that God placed that woman in your life. It was a divine purpose and hand of God. You, everything that happened to you and everything that happened to your spouse in that timeline to bring you together was sovereignly decreed by God, amen? So I want to touch on and I know I have to end because I'm, I'm already going to go over time, which I usually do every Sunday. But anyway, you need to know something about marriage. And one of my professors at Moody Bible was completely, completely theologically off when he talked to us one day about, about marriage, which is why I ended up committing adultery about 15 years later, by the way. But he told us in class that it doesn't matter who you marry as long as they're a true believer in Jesus Christ. So if there's like 20 girls out there, and they're all true believers in Jesus Christ, God doesn't care about which one that the guy picks to marry. That's almost bordering the line of a heresy called open theology, that God doesn't know the future. That is the biggest lie in the world for you to ever believe that about marriage. And obviously, look what he did. Inappropriate things with his secretary. If God is sovereign, and he is sovereign, he has divinely chosen your spouse for you, even when you don't like him or her. God has sovereignly picked that person for you. And so when you're angry at that person, you're angry at your spouse, you're really angry at God. Because God's the one that chose him or her for you. It's like, no, I was at a bar and I was totally drunk. It wasn't my fault. I didn't know. No. Is God sovereignly in control? That's why you're married. Doesn't matter what all the bad decisions you made leading up to that, God is not controlled by your bad decisions. God is sovereign in his choices and his predestination of your life. And that's why when you write up a timeline, why should it encourage you? Because when you do it in prayer and you do it with a sincere heart, you will see the faithfulness of God in your life. And mark my words, and some of you may not believe me right now, events, memories, divine context will come to your mind that you've forgotten about for 20, 30 years. And God is going to open your eyes up to see those and how important those are. Why am I encouraging on a Sunday morning doing a timeline? Isn't this like for high school or college class? That's what church should be about, amen? It should be about training you and giving you practical things that are going to help equip and strengthen you in your Christian life. And doing a timeline is one of them. 
And why are we talking about a timeline now? Because we are reading and studying through a timeline of Joseph. The timeline was given by God to us, was it not? The dates were given. The events, the key divine context, everything was given to instruct us about what we ourselves should do in our own Christian lives to feel strengthened and equipped. And the more equipped and strengthened you are to fight the spiritual battles, to be strengthened in God, to live successfully the Christian life, the stronger you're going to feel, the more encouraged and the more joy you're going to experience, aren't you? God wants to give you all the right tools to build his kingdom, and he does not fail as a master builder. He knows exactly what you need. He has built you with a precision that no laser could compete with. He knows the reason why he made you the way he has made you. And I remember this day, a divine moment with my professor, who was a divine contact, Ken Hanna, who trained me, who taught me. He was 27 years in Latin America as a missionary evangelist. But I'll never forget, as I got back from Peru, from the Amazon, um, and even uh, a past trip in Colombia, and then going to Nicaragua, he did a debrief with me that following semester. And he knew me pretty well. But he said, your personality is not really the right personality for some place like Peru or South America because the culture is so different. But your personality is exactly what Nicaragua needs. And I already knew God had called me to Nicaragua. And God sent him for many reasons. But in that moment as a divine contact to show me he made my personality exactly for the culture of Nicaragua. And now exactly for the culture of Bozeman. Even though a lot of people get mad at me, that's okay. A lot of people in Nicaragua got mad at me. But God designs you for exactly where you're at and what he has called you to do. He does not make mistakes. He is master and Lord of your life. You are not. And that should not discourage you, put a weight on you. What? I'm not in control of my life? I'm not making my own decisions? That should help you to the point of resting in the Lord. For he has said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Why? Because he is running the show. He is or ordering all of the events and all of the circumstances in your life. But never ever forget, they do not define who God is and what his word says and his promises. This book does. This book defines my view of God and how God views me. Not the world around me. So I'd encourage you all to remember this throughout the week. Why did God promise that he will never leave us nor abandon us nor forsake us when our sins are so grievous to him? Because we know that Christ took our abandonment that we deserved and bore it on the cross once and for all. He was forsaken by God and the wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus Christ. Amen? And Jesus said from the cross before he gave up his spirit, Eli, elach sebachthini, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken because God will never forsake you because he took your, God's wrath and God's punishment for you. Jesus' death on the cross secured God's promises for all of eternity, a physical event reality. Jesus showing us that our Lord, our God will never fail which is why he rose again from the dead on the third day. That is our hope and our assurance for you to know that even when you feel totally forgotten by God and everyone else, even your family, remember Psalm 27, what David so powerfully stated, even though my mother and father have forsaken me, you will take me in. There is no mother, greatest mother in the world, greatest father in the world that can compare with the love of God. It's impossible. Rest in that truth. Dear Jesus, I pray that, Lord, you would stir our hearts to have true changes in our life. That, Lord, if we're left to ourselves, we will always stay the same. We will commit the same sins, follow the same patterns. We will not advance your kingdom because we'll still be following the same patterns we have for the past 30, 40 years. So, Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to recognize your divine fingerprint on our lives, even before we are born. 
you are intricately making us and weaving us into being. And so, Lord, I pray for each person with the sound of my voice. That, Lord, everyone in this room would leave this morning with a softer heart. With a more humble heart. With a more grateful, worshipful heart. That, Jesus, you have promised that you will never leave us, nor abandon us, nor forsake us. And that, Lord, your character is perfect. You cannot lie. Your word is for sure. And, Lord, I pray that our hope in our life will never, ever be circumstances, but will always be the fact that you are a good God. You are a perfect God. That all of life and all of prosperity is dependent 100% on thus saith the Lord that your promises are my bedrock and my security your promises are what changes my darkness to light my dungeon into a palace my hopelessness into a great joy my broken marriage into a marriage of resurrection my broken child into a child of strength and joy and hope because your promises never fail. Your word is for sure. Not one letter will be taken away from it. You are our bedrock. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would become greater and we would become smaller. That we'd see your glory as we have never seen before. And you'd raise up a great, mighty army of warriors of Jesus Christ. You have chosen to build your kingdom. Realizing, Lord, that their joy will be made full. Just as you promised in John 15. That is our hope and that is our assurance. And that is also our confirmation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen much for watching Petra Bible Church Bozeman. We will have a new sermon uploaded each week for both English and Spanish services. And remember, hit like and subscribe. Thank you and God bless.